Ryan Serhant is the star of Million Dollar Listing New York. He sold over six billion dollars with real estate and he's about to give us an inside look into the 2023 housing market in a way that you've never seen before we can buy an apartment here for two million and you'll sell it for five he's also currently selling the most expensive listing in the world right now selling for 250 million dollars a penthouse in new york and homes like those are sold to billionaires as in with a b so we're getting the behind the curtain look at what billionaires are actually like behind the scenes when there's no cameras there's no nothing just ryan surhant and them and the stories i gotta say are insane so with that said enjoy subscribe if you're not already and now let's begin but first we want to thank our sponsor creative juice as a creator you're running a business and as a business you got to have a business banking account that's separate from all of your personal stuff well fortunately Graham creative juice is the perfect place to get started juice funds creative futures so that you could stay in control of your content and supercharge your growth not only does juice provide creators with funding it's a one-stop shop for all of your creator banking needs think debit cards with rewards invoicing team collaboration tools paying your contractors real-time analytics and more let juice automate your business so that you could stay focused on what matters the most which is your content and i love that they also offer funding like their juice funds refresh and reserve program that allows you to get the funding you need to make the content you want just choose refresh for your short-term needs or reserve for up to two million dollars in funding to grow your business as an investor in juice myself i recognize just how helpful funding could be juice funds offers 100 creator control flexible deal links starting as short as three months trust-based relationships easy payouts and dedicated support from industry experts you could use these funds to purchase studio space hire freelance help or do anything else that you believe will help expand the business. So sign up for a free Creative Juice business banking account today by using the link down below in the description or by going to getjuice.com slash get funding. So get started now and take control of your creator business. Once again, guys, it's completely free. The link down below in the description. Thank you so much and on to the podcast. Well, thanks so much for making it on the Ice Coffee Hour, Ryan Serhant. I missed out this morning. You guys were touring a $250 million penthouse, yes. the most expensive listing in the United States. Is it in the world? Most expensive listing in the world? Mm, I don't think so. I, I think it's the most expensive active active listing in the United States. There's definitely other properties out there where people are like, you know, uh, this one is a hundred, you know, a billion dollars. This oh, is this. Yeah, like, yeah. There's off markets in Malibu and Palm yeah, Beach yeah. that are quietly marketed for half a billion dollars, you know, but they're, they're not actively out there and this is your personal listing or is it just like... I mean, it's not my house i don't live there oh right 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 it's not right. like my you know i'm just putting one day my, own, my own crib right uh yeah one day <laughs> um uh yes it's our it's our listing yeah so we have it listed you missed out jack i, I was telling oh, jack... you didn't even get to see it you didn't show up no. didn't get to oh, were you sleeping it. no well i just wanted to make sure i was ripe and, and tuned up for this podcast that was my goal i was like okay i'll get good sleep are you all staying in the same spot no okay so you're yeah. not staying in, in harlem where he got a nice ritzy ritzy pad you got a nice spot I think it's it's two bedrooms. Wow. That's nice for New York. That's cool. yeah. pretty good. Yeah, so no, I'm not staying? with them. I'm staying with my buddy, Sean. The guy that goes up, asks people questions on the okay, street. Okay, cool. He's a uh, Kips Bay. Nice. Yeah, so I'm there. Yeah. Nice, nice. So. I was trying to get Jack to go, and he's like, oh, no. It's like, Jack, how often do you have the opportunity to do this? Yeah. I was like, no, dude, I'm enjoying Kips Bay. <laughs> he compared it. He compared this place. I love 31st Street. Ryan, I'm just loving it. He compared it to a $45 million home in L.A. And he's is like, really, well, if a, I saw that, it's good. Oh, it's, it's a really like, hard no. corner to get myself out of that I've somehow <laughs> put myself in. But like, I've seen a forty million dollar place in yep. L.A. and that just like it blew my mind. And yeah. I'm wondering, like, okay, what's the difference between forty and two hundred fifty million it's for the average difference. layman? It's Huge. like for me, I see something. I'm like, I don't even know what material that yeah, countertop sure. is made of, that. but it's I the understand. best. You I know what it. I mean? Yeah, I get so. it. So. I don't know. I, I would have loved to see the view. That's the one thing. But I watched an entire like long YouTube video, your YouTube video on it. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. kind of got like the you get the it. feeling for it. You Jake's know? the type of person like I don't need to see the Great Barrier Reef. I saw a YouTube video on it. <laughs> no. Yeah, it's the same thing. I, I, I don't know. travel. <laughs> I've seen Paris on TV. You know what? Okay, yeah. Maybe I could. Saw an yeah. Instagram picture of it. But exactly. It looked lovely. From, it was from the video that I watched. On it, it was. So. Yes. And thanks for this. We're like pinch hitting for Ice Coffee Hour in our podcast studio in our Sirhan headquarters in yeah. Soho right now. Our pleasure. So welcome yeah. to our set. Crazy team, by I the know. way. Like it's very rare that we do podcasts with people and they're like one, two, three, four, five, six other people in the room. Yeah, which you're is, stressing me out with how many of them there it's are. It's cool. I this like is, it. Yeah. You, it's Graham like a live one. audience, honestly. Yeah. Graham's got you. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and you. It's a two. Yeah. 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 That's it. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. You are busy, by the way. Could you walk us through your schedule? Because even getting you for like an hour, I was talking to your team. We're like, we should do TikToks and this and that and this. You're like, yeah, we know we've tried. We just can't. <laughs> we, we we keep telling them this, and I'm like, I'll tell them too. I'll back them up on this. You are so busy. 
Like every hour of your day is so finely scheduled where you're like, I have a heart out, 10, yeah. 15, I have to leave. I'll be there exactly at this time. How do you, like, what's your day like? It depends on the day. I mean, so there's, there's, uh, you know, there's a holding company, okay? And underneath that are three separate businesses. So there's Sirhant Real Estate. There is uh, Sirhant Studios, right? And then there's what we call Sell Like Sirhant, which is education. So, and, and I run all three. Now, there's great lieutenants and people for all of them. I'm not doing everything mm -hmm. right across the board. There's a lot of different people, but I'm incredibly involved in all three businesses all day long. So it depends on the day. Real estate takes up a significant amount of my time. Underneath that, there is, there's real estate resale, right? There's real estate new dev. New development takes up a lot of my time. There's buy side, sell side stuff. There's ADX, which is the tech stuff. There's, there's, there's just a lot. There's a lot of meetings. There's a lot of things that I got to do to keep the business moving forward. There's recruitment. There's growth. There's pitching. We're, we're going to double in size this year. We're going to expand into a lot of new markets. So that's a lot. On the education side, there's nonstop content creation, Zooms, lives, coaching, the mentorship. And on the studio side, then it's like mm -hmm. where I have time, then it's me creating personal content, which is tough, which is why a lot of our content is very like run and gun, jump in the car, you know, kind yeah. of vlog day in the life type of stuff or real estate tours because that's then what we do. All right. Um, and then wherever else I can then find time ends up being wait, I'm married. I should, I should see her. Uh, and then, oh, also I have a baby. I should see, I should see her, you know? And then I try to sleep. And then you said so, dadder days. Was it, was that your word? Dadder days? Saturdays. No, there's a book called dadder day uh, that someone gave to me when okay. I, when I was about to have Xena. And so it's, um, it's actually a really sad book. It's about a dad who just like, well, I thought it was fun, but it's like this dad who hangs out with his daughter all the time. And then, you know, Saturday is dadder day and they like have a plan every week. And mm. she like has a, a notepad in the kitchen where she writes down everything I'm going to do with dad on Saturday because he works all the time. Yeah. Right now, Saturday, that's the day. And then in the, it's like a kid's book in the book, like dad gets fired. Dad has to get new job. New job works on weekends. Dad travels all the time. No more dad on dadder day. And she like cries by the window, like cartoon, everything. The mom's like, daddy still loves you. <laughs> and I like oh read God. this book and I'm like, what on earth? Who's the it's book like, written for? I don't know. It sounds like it's written for adults at yeah, this point. It's, it's just like, it's, it's too know. real. It's like insane. And at the end, like they change the day. It's like dadder day can be any time, right? Even in your imagination because dad can't afford to spend time with you. It's like- <laughs> It's it's tra it's traumatized. So I try to wait. Did you read this to your child or no? I do read it to she get it fully. She's like, ha ha, daddy cry. I'm like yeah, but um, yeah. So Saturdays <laughs> oh are dadder days if it's a normal week. But like this past weekend, we were shooting one of our new courses. So I shoot all day Saturday. I'll do all day Sunday when we do the courses because I can't do them during the week. This coming Saturday, I got to shoot a new course. Sunday is then a work day. So it's. There's a lot of times where it's a couple months on end where there's no days off, but then where I when I have the time, Saturday will be dadder day. Yeah. Do you have strict clock in, clock out times, or is it kind of just like wake up, let's go, and then go to bed? Um, no, I'm pretty regimented. It you know it depends. So on Sunday mm. nights, I'll I'll talk to so my main assistant um, is is Will, and so we'll discuss calendar for the next seven days, and then I'll discuss it with my wife Amelia just to determine like, hey, um, part of our deal. Right, is that I come home to see Zena twice a week before she goes to bed. So I see her before she goes to bed at least twice a week. If that's going to be really hard, then I'm also taking her to school twice a week um, in the morning. So I drop her off at then 9 a.m., um, which is then, you know, which is downtown. Um, so I try to see her a little bit more. Other than that, I would, I would end up getting home at like 9, 10 p.m. every single night because of a client event or something, or I've got to stay in the office. And then I would just, like I would literally mm. see her on Saturdays only. How earlier are you wake up? Four thirty. It's been the wow. same. Wow. It's been the same forever. But what time do you go to bed to wake up at four thirty? It depends. Honestly, it depends. Like the latest I'll go to bed is eleven. So like last night was eleven. If I can, if I could go to bed at like six p.m., I would so do <laughs> really? it. Really? Right. Um, most times it's somewhere like ten. 10 30 monday through friday okay saturday i won't wake up at 4 30 mm -hmm. it, it depends on again it, it depends on the day and depends on the work and what i'm doing um so if it's a dadder day i'll like work out at like 8 a.m but i still won't sleep much later than like mm. six you know yeah. i just won't get out I, I just won't move yeah i'll just do what everyone else does where i'll like lay there and be like no i'm just gonna i'm just gonna look at three more tiktoks sure right and then like an hour later you're do still you, tiktoking do you moisturize i do moisturize. you know i asked about his skin 
It just it looks incredible. Your skin looks better than mine. I know. <laughs> Twenty four. That is. Tell like, tell them about the, the regular. What's, yeah. what's your secret, man? I, I thought, it, dude. I thought it was like it had to be like Botox because no. it looks too perfect. You look like you get like twelve hours of sleep every night. No, no, I backed under my eyes now. It's puffy. Those are in the comments, um, <laughs> uh, and it gets to me emotionally. The uh, no, dude. I I bad skin when I was growing up. Okay, I bad skin when I was growing up, and I wanted to be an actor, so it like really affected me. Right, I was super sensitive about it. Like it affected dating, like this, that, the other. It was super oily. Had had bad acting, and then as that started to transition, it's not like my skin cleared up. It transitioned into like full blown rosacea, like a fifty five year old guy in Colorado, where like I always looked like I was sunburnt, like I was bright red. And if I had caffeine, or it was too warm, or like any kind of triggers, like if you look at it, there's these triggers, and like I would just be bright, and I would just walk into rooms, and people would be like, oh. Man, what are you? What are you outside all day, man? You got a lot of sun. I'm like, no, I have a disease, and it's uh, uh, you know, it's not that big of a deal when you're much, much older. But when you're like 23 in New York City, trying to like get on a soap opera, or do theater, you know, it's like that's what you're known for. If you're the guy that walks in with premature gray hair and a bright red face, people are like, oh, you're the gray-haired crayon. <laughs> like it's just, you know, it gets to you. Um, and so uh, I did low dose Accutane. Um, four times, uh, did that four times, took a long time to clear up skin. And then from there, I read a book by a guy named Dr. Nays called Beating Rosacea that like saved my life. And in it, uh, actually in it, he's the one who talked about uh, low dose Accutane. So I took that. Um, and then there's a new laser treatment. It's not new anymore, but at the time it was new. It was called V-beam. And so it would shrink, it would shrink the blood vessels in your face and therefore the pores and limit your sebaceous glands. And so I did a V beam laser treatment and like my, my skin fell off. I looked like Freddy Krueger. It was insane. Um, and that, it happens like the first time you do it. And I've done it like every other December since then. My skin doesn't fall off anymore. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't even notice. I could do it today. You wouldn't notice. Um, but I've been good ever since. Um, uh, but I also, I wear SPF every day. Mm, I wear, um, an SPF every single day. Um, I wash my face twice a day with like this mud soap and at night and this deep cleanser in the morning. And I don't know. You I don't should really do a drink. video on your skincare routine. You really should. Yeah. These guys. Oh my gosh! So come ideas. on. I don't know why we don't do this stuff. I like. Okay, it's it's not a full video, but that's a short. It's viral. For that sure. that's a forty-five yeah. to you know sixty seconds. Yeah. yeah. Yes. 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 So S <laughs> SPF, but funny. I also listen at the same time. I, I eat relatively pretty clean. Um, I work out a lot, so I sweat a lot, right? So I sweat a lot, so I, I clean my, my face a lot. Yeah. Um, and then I also, I don't really drink. Like I don't like to taste of alcohol. Like I'll have a glass of wine once a week and I don't smoke, mm -hmm. you know, or anything like that. I think that also possibly yeah. helps. So what about as far as going gray? When did you start noticing that? 16. 16. Yeah. What what was that experience like? Did that run in the family? Did you have someone yeah, like Yeah, my, a... my dad said he started graying when he was early and he's like you'll be white by 30. And I was like gross. Yeah. Um and it it you know it affected me just like everything, right? Like you're a teenager and like anything that's if you, you know, if you're not like on the sports team, everything about you is just not right. Mm -hmm. And so and I also like theater. <laughs> so I was like bright red acne slightly overweight and i like theater and oh also i was graying so yeah. i was like sweet awesome um uh so when i moved to new york after college no when i was in college i would like diet by myself hmm. with like the gloves and the stuff and the just for men thing um and then when i moved to new york all but then i would go to like a hair salon and diet but it, you know if you dye your hair it feels weird you know it starts to feel and it's just like it's such sure. a pain in the ass because you have short hair yeah like a woman dyes her hair she can at least you know, she grows it for a little bit longer. She's not; she doesn't have to do it every ten days. Like, you were doing it every ten days. My hair grows so wow. fast, and so yeah, every ten days to two weeks, I'd have to go dye my hair so I could go to these auditions in New York City where people weren't like, "Do you have great tips? Like, what's happening?" <laughs> like, it just would look weird. If you look at like early soap opera days for me on As the World Turns, which is like the first thing I did in New mm. York, I am super pale because I had zapped all the redness out. Right, I was super pale. And they were dyeing my hair on set and they would dye it so dark brown it would look black. I looked like – I looked sick. I looked like Dracula. Like I was super pale with really, really dark hair and I would just look like I – I, like, I looked weak. It was just weird. Wow.
But, but now you like yeah, it because it's like a great it. marketing thing for you now, right? No, then I got it's into so real estate. because they, Then yeah. I ran out of money. Then I was like, I, I, what am I going to do? Do I go home? Do I, you know, stuff. I think we talked about on, on our last podcast, yeah. a little bit of that stuff. And so uh, then I just stopped dying it because it, it was also either expensive or I'd have to do it on my own. It was just messy. So I was like, screw it. And um, when I first got into the business, my hair was still dyed because I just looked weird. Like I was super young face, super old man hair. And it, it looked weird. But then people would ask me, they're like, oh, you're young. Like, should we really go look at apartments with you? And then I don't remember. I think I just like forgot to. I got lazy about dyeing it. And then I realized retroactively, people have stopped asking me how long I've been in this business. People have stopped asking me like how young I am. I think they they like would look at me and then look at my hair and then say, and he just must take care of himself. <laughs> this this 40-year-old guy. And I'd be like, yep, that's me. I've been doing this for a long, long time. And then it just sort of became my calling card. Like people would start recognizing me from the back of my head. Yeah. Because they'd be like, what an interesting assortment of salt and pepper. <laughs> you know? Yeah, just- I think when Million Dollar Listing New York first came out, the first thing I noticed was the hair. And that yeah. just stuck out to me. It's just, it's unique. It's not yeah. good or bad. It's just, it's, it's a you. staple. Sure. It is. Yeah, it was just the silver thing. And so then I've just, obviously, I've, obviously I haven't dyed it. And it's just gotten farther further and further gray ever since. Oh, next time next yeah. time we do this, when we hit the trifecta, the hat trick for, for iced coffee hour, I'll walk in Anderson sure. Cooper white. Nice. And you'd be like, yeah. oh, you finally made it. I'm like, yep. Do you find that stress or like a busy schedule makes it gray faster? Probably. Or do you think it's just all genetic at this point? I think the kickoff was oh. definitely genetic. So I think there was a lot of genetics to do. Uh, to do with that. But I also think I live a, a pretty fast, very high stress life. Like yeah. I'm stressed all day long. Are you motivated by stress? It drives you? I don't know. I, I think I'm I'm motivated by pressure. Mm-hmm. Like I'll complain about it, but I, I do live off of it. I'm motivated by, by, um, by like, you know, by timelines, right? By deadlines. Like I'm motivated by my schedule. Mm-hmm. Like I, my schedule doesn't have to be crazy. I kind of create the chaos more than anything, but um, uh, I think the stress and the things and all the stuff mm. definitely does add to to everything. Like, you know, workouts are way harder for me than they ever used to be. The hair is definitely grayer. The bags under the eye, you know, it's mm. slowly. And I've become a Tough product life, of my right? environment, yeah. you know? I'm just like a product of New York City. It's the grime. And you're, you're a fan of that intense lifestyle, constantly feeling like you're under pressure. And uh, like you got to catch up or something. You're a fan of that. I guess so. I mean, I, I'm used to it now. So now it's like my normal. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like when people, we had Billy McFarland on, on our podcast talking about jail. And he was like, he totally understands why when people leave jail, they go right back because they they get so used to the structure. They get used to the four walls. They hate it. They complain about it. I shouldn't be in here. The minute they get out, it's like where my walls go. Like I, I, I dip, nope, got to do something to get back in jail. I want someone to tell me what to really? do and I want someone to give mm-hmm. me my food at the right time. They like the habit. And so I think there is some sort of like masochism to the, the addiction that I have now to the insanity of the schedule and to the habit of the routine. But I do take breaks. Like, Dude, there is dad or day. Sure. I do go on vacations right. now. I never used to go on vacation. My wife's Greek. They spend all summer in Greece. So now I have this baby and baby. So I'll go to Greece for a week here, a week there, and there's no 4.30 a.m.s there. Like, I'm not a, I'm not a psycho. It's often people yeah. commit petty crimes to go back to jail. That's like a, I didn't know a that. fairly common yeah. thing. Yeah, because that's just their new life. And yeah. what, I know this is kind of a weird parallel to draw, but one thing I've noticed was like, if you know who Liver King is, yes. I don't know. Yeah. So he lives a very intense life. Yes. Right? Like he's working out like three times every day, just constantly putting himself under a lot of stress and pressure. Yep. And I feel like it would be more challenging for him to relax and more uncomfortable to relax than to constantly be put in this conventional discomfort of working out. Yeah, he's going to feel empty. Fire. Exactly. Yeah, he's going to feel empty. He's going to feel lost. You need the energy that way if you're that type of person. I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, man, I wish I could just be someone who goes with the flow. Like, hey, there's a dinner. I got to go to the dinner. Like, oh, you know, I'm going to do that. Or friends saying, hey, you want to come hang out? And I'd be like, yep, yep, yep. You basically have gotten used to this very intense lifestyle and you're a fan of it now. But sometimes you do wish that you could have a more relaxed schedule. Yeah, I just don't think I'm the type of person who can just wing it like Mm -hmm. i know people who you know are in the real estate business who like don't even like they don't have a calendar Mm -hmm. like i know like there's an agent i know who does like a billion dollars a year and she like do you have your calendar on her phone she's like nope 
I'm like, how do you know where to go? She's like, oh, I get a printout from my assistant. I'm like, how do you know who to call and what to do? And she's like, oh, I guess I kind of remember. I'm like, do you ever forget anything? She's like, oh my God, I forget things all the time. <laughs> but she does a billion dollars a year. So does it actually matter? She has her way of operating. I have my ridiculous way of operating. There's other, everyone's got their own way. You just have to do the way that ends yeah. up working for you. Yeah. How often are you showing properties now? I showed properties today. So I was with you this morning. Yeah. So I guess I showed that to you. Okay. Uh, and then I went with a client. I had to show properties, um, uh, which is more and more and more a rare occurrence. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll handle VIPs now. Like VIPs, special property, special things I need to show. Also still, you know, I'm showing, I don't know, the other day where one of our agents needed me to show. And I, I showed. Like mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do that if I have the time and if I can schedule it and I can, I can make it happen. But my time is probably not best used showing anymore mm -hmm. now that we're you know building and, and growing the business is are there, you oh, go ahead. i was just curious is there a threshold like in terms of the dollar amount that if a client says i want you to show me properties uh 15 million dollars like is that a threshold where you would say okay i'm gonna drop my schedule or, or make out a day for this i'm just curious at what level you would say that you would spend your time doing showings or walking on one client in particular it depends if it's a if it's a personal referral client to me you know, someone says, you know, hey, Ryan, I need you to take out this person. Like I was just with uh, a personal referral who's a very, very important client. And it was to help them find a rental for their daughters. Mm. Right. And like I typically wouldn't do that if I don't know the person. But for them, like I'm there. Right. I'm showing them around. That's that's my job. And mm -hmm. I don't ever really want to lose that. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, it, it depends. It depends also on future business. I care very much about future. So if, if it's a one-time person, they come through and they have a $10 million budget, you know, if I, if I can balance that time, then I can take it. But oftentimes it's never a quick thing. It takes forever. Then they change their mind. Then they want to rent something. Then they don't, blah, 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 blah. So I always work with, with agents here. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of our lead flow. Like yeah. I gave out 700 leads last year alone just to agents here not even part of our like Sirhant connect referral wow. network there's a lot of lead flow to agents that work um at Sirhant everywhere and so they'll take those people but typically like if it's like 20 million and above like i'll be there personally and it'll end up making sense for for time i just wanted to know what the difference is like because i'm sure it's not the same uh structure that you follow if you're selling a 250 million dollar house to selling like a you know 500 thousand dollar townhome yeah. somewhere else like what differences for the for the average person can you expect if you're like i'm sure you're probably not throwing open houses right no for this 250 million dollar place you could you know we'll do like we're doing a very very high fashion event at the big penthouse right coming up um we've done a couple like hedge fund dinners and things so we'll do we won't do open houses on sundays from 2 to 3 oh p.m God, right imagine that yeah that <laughs> would line. that would we, we would never be allowed to, and it would just be bad. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll do the alternate version, which are like targeted marketing events where you get the right types of people in the space. And it's something we're really, really good at doing. And it's it's a part of why we get hired because we can bring the right eyeballs, both virtually, digitally, and in person to a space to try to get the absolute best price and to sell it. Because for a place like that, right, something that's asking $250 million, um, uh, someone's going to buy it and that person's not going to even know that they wanted to buy it. They're going to make the decision mm -hmm. um, once they find out about the property and they're going to say, let's go see that. That thing looks crazy. They know they can afford it, but they're not like house hunting. You know, it's not like they decided, honey, we need a new seven bedroom in New York budget somewhere between 20 million and 500 million. <laughs> like that's not <laughs> how people think these properties are always sold you know, um, in, they're sold typically spur of the moment. Like I sold a house in Palm Beach last year, um, pretty famously for just under $140 million. And I met that guy on a Tuesday to find things in New York City. We've decided to look in Florida randomly on Wednesday. We flew to Florida on Thursday. We were in contract on that place by Friday. And the budget he gave me was plus minus 20. And so I showed him a place that was asking 140 and he walked around and then I showed him other things that, you know, I thought he was going to potentially buy. He hated them all, bought that big one. How does it work if he wants to buy here and just like on a whim is like, no, I'm actually going to move to Florida. Because how, how does that happen? When you're worth, yeah, I know. F yes. For us, like stressful, right? Like, <laughs> I, what am I going to do? Go tell my wife, hey, babe, by the way, we're moving across the country. Like, yeah. you know, um, but for somebody like that, 
you know, like what changed? It, he's a, um, it was a conversation that I had with him about like the necessity of being in New York at the time, right? Like you're looking in New York City. Uh, it's an interesting market right now. You, you, you need to be here? No. And he said he didn't need to be there. And so he kind of sparked that initial mm. convo. He's like, listen, we're everywhere. We're kind of all over the place. But, you know, we're coming back to New York. I think we should probably get a place. Oh, you should probably get a place. Could you work from anywhere? Yeah, I could work from anywhere. And we had so many clients that I was selling to in Florida. We were doing deal after deal mm -hmm. in Florida. I was like, have you ever thought about Florida? He's like, ah, I don't know. Like Miami. I'm like, no, no, no. You don't have to go to Miami. Like, what about Palm Beach? There's a lot of finance types who are in Palm Beach. It's like, oh, maybe, you know, potentially, like, you know, you should talk to your accountant, <laughs> like about the, the potential tax savings. It's mm -hmm. the beginning of the year. If you declare residency there, I don't know how much money you make, but New York City tax, I mean, you're going to save- 10%, right? More, more. right? How you much save. is the tax here in Manhattan? So is I that think, on top of I think the state all tax? New York, New York State and New York City tax, I think you end up saving somewhere between 13 and 15%. Wow. So it's, it's a lot, right? And so, um, and everything all included, right? And because then you got New York City property tax and, right. and everything combined. And so it ended up being this massive tax savings. And so, yeah, so that those things can happen really, really quickly. It's the $2 million right. buyers that'll look for three years. Now, but now I'm curious, when you decide to fly to Palm Beach, do you guys get in a private plane? Do you book like he first does. class or like? I, sometimes I can, I can catch a ride. Most <laughs> times I catch a ride. But to be completely honest, yeah. Like, you know, I love all my clients equally, but if I'm going to fly with you and it's private, like there's no movies, we're not getting like, yes, there's, there's a, there's a, a flight attendant, right? You're there, but like they're there. And now I have to sit here for hours and we are just going to talk. And sometimes that's good. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's like. I gotta think about what to talk to you about. Like, how am I gonna talk to you about real estate the entire? And then you're gonna ask me all these questions. What if I don't know the question? Like, it's a lot. So on that one, I, I met him there. Interesting. So you feel pressured to like be friendly with them and to like continue the conversation it's the, and stuff like it's, that. For me, it would be the intimidation of just like you don't want to screw this up. At least that's how say I say something would feel. dumb or like no, a joke that doesn't it, land. I don't or get like, nervous about saying anything dumb. I get nervous about like. Can I relax in front of this guy? Like, if I slouch funny or if I'm like. I, you know, because we do a lot back and forth between California and different yeah. places. And like, if I'm going to fly private with someone I just met, let's say, right, sometimes um, for five hours, like American Airlines sounds real nice. You know, like I'll just sit yeah. up the front. It's stressful. It's just a lot. Just do my, yeah, meet yeah. there because you're going to spend so much time with that person on the way. But that's also the type of, like, it's, it's probably one of my weaknesses, right? Mm -hmm. There's plenty of people who can take that situation and turn it into a hundred other situations and they would like envy it and eat it up. And I, I can do that, right, with, with certain people. Um, uh, but a lot of times, you know, I find too that you end up spending time on the planes and they're reading the whole yeah. time and you're reading quietly in an airplane. It kind of feels like an Uber where you can never really tell. Like sometimes you just want yeah. silence and the, or, or sometimes they're, or they're really doing quiet work. and you're like, are they just angry today? Is it a bad day? Or they just want to give you space? Yeah, or they're doing work, yeah. you know, um, which is totally, which is totally fine. Is it, everyone I, I work with, for the most part, ends up being like a real pleasure to work with, and yeah. they're great. It's more just my personal insecurities and and issues of why, like sometimes I'll just I'll just meet you there. And remember too, when they fly private, they leave on their terms. It's not on my terms. So a lot of times guys will say, hey, we're, right, we're going to fly down tomorrow at 8 o'clock. You want to fly with us? I say yes. And then they don't show up because they had a meeting. It's not – they don't care about my schedule, right? They come like an hour late or something else or they're like, yeah, we're going to leave tomorrow. Now I flew with them, let's say. Now we're super late. Mm -hmm. Now i got to wait for him to fly back and he decides, oh, we're not going to fly back on Friday. I think we're going to go back Sunday. Cool. I'm like, Does that I have a life. Does that happen? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. That's why they fly private so they don't have to operate within anyone other's timeline other than their own. You know, and so like you then get stuck that way and it's like, Sh okay, well, I got to go now book a commercial airline. It's fine. Have you ever thought about flying private or no? You know what? We, we've flown private once to Canada and it was the worst. Why is everyone laughing? Is there, why is there, I feel like there's a story. Because they were stuck with me <laughs> because uh, no one told us that to fly internationally, uh, especially into Canada to, to get to leave, there's one phone number you call. And you got to wait for like one guy to get on the phone to give you clearance and to give you the code. And then you can take off. And we it took, we like waited an hour, hour and a half. 
hour and a half. And then you land, mm -hmm. you got to call the same guy before you can get off the plane. Like we literally have content where we were just like getting real claustrophobic on this little plane sitting there. And they're like, sorry, it never takes this long. I'm like, has it ever taken this long before? And they were like, well, yes, actually. <laughs> I'm like, we must get off this plane. It was awful. We, we all, we just took, we just flew commercial wow. on the way back. We're like, thanks wow. so much. Yeah. I, Cause it's like commercial airlines. They're big, they're fast. You know, they, they're easy. You can have snacks. You do your own thing. It's fine. You know, if you have TSA or clear, like you're not. You know, it's not that much of a pain in the ass. It's like, it's, it's fine. And you save so much money. I'm like you, like, I don't want to, it's, I, I, it's just like, I don't want to spend the money. Mm -hmm. Like you look at this building, like we have this whole yeah. building in the middle of Soho, right? You have the whole building. Yeah, Is there anything in here that you, that you sublease? No, it's all us. So the whole building. How many but, square feet is that? 15,000. 15,000 square feet. Yeah. Can you see what the rent is? Uh, I don't know what my rent is right now. I think the rent is 75,000 a month. Hmm. How much I would think. this building be worth if you were to purchase it? I don't know. A 20, lot. 25? A lot. Yeah, I do not pay a rent that's commensurate with, with what it would actually be worth. Okay. Right? It would be worth a lot. Um, it would sell for a lot. Like, I think Gucci across the street just sold for like $100 million really? as a store, one floor. This is four floors. So, that's the one thing I noticed in New York as, as far as like cap rates are concerned or any sort of return that you get on most apartments, buildings is like low. three, three and a half percent. Yeah, if you're lucky. Oftentimes why, you're just looking to carry costs because New York, so City is, yeah. because New York City is built on appreciation. It's like where you can buy an apartment here for two million and you'll sell it for five if you can hold. Not all the time, but like it's and commercial but too, retail. Do you think there's ever a chance that maybe it doesn't see the appreciation long term because people are working from computers, they're going to Florida? Yeah, now, now, but I, I would say like work from home has not changed New York City's real estate business irreparably. Like it, it slowed it down for mm -hmm. a hot minute, but now you have different types of people, right? Like there's always just a big changing of the guard. It's like when China put in capital controls and all of a sudden all the Chinese money dried up that was feeding New York City real estate. Mm -hmm. Then it switched. It was different countries that all of a sudden came through. And when currency moves, right? We watch currency exchanges yeah. a lot. When there's currency moves, money will come in or then money will leave, right? Then you start reaching out to foreign clients and just say, hey, just so you know, we're par now or up. It would be a good time for you to sell. You'll make 20% more at the same price than you would have a year ago. Start to have those types of conversations. I'm curious because the typical person that would buy a $250 million penthouse, would they're probably a billionaire, yep. you would say, at that point? Yeah, like many you kinda times have, over. Yeah. Many times over. Yes. So you're probably in contact with a lot of different billionaires, right? Yes. Is yeah. there any trends that you've noticed amongst like the ultra wealthy, the people that like, you know, I could potentially never meet in my entire life, the average person could never meet, some trends that you've noticed, maybe about their personality, their characteristics? They're super normal for the most part. I've never met like, some of them are quirky, but they're, they're just like us. Like they just happen to be way wealthier. <laughs> like Do you just... think that there's a trend, like some character trait or personality trait? They're on guard. See? They're Everyone, on guard. they're always on guard of being taken advantage of for the most part, like everything. Like, did they charge me too much here? Did they charge me too much there? I, like, you can see it kind of in the corner of their eye. <laughs> Graham's going to be a billionaire now. Yeah. <laughs> they're just like, I'm on the right track. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. They're on guard. And they also, uh, they do not waste time. Like, they don't waste time. There's no, like literally no wasting of the time because their time is so much better spent elsewhere and they will make massive decisions incredibly quickly hmm. because they they trust their ability to make decisions fast it's probably the biggest thing that i've taken away from working with billionaires versus working with everyone else and something that i think a lot of us can really you know replicate and, and learn from it's like i i see so much analysis paralysis in decisions that have absolutely no need for it. Hmm. Like I'll go to dinner with a billionaire client. They order, like the waiter comes over to get water, orders are made. There's no, just like, it, it is not that they're in a rush for dinner. It's, there is no benefit to the time to me to look, to think, what could I want? Oh, do, what about the chicken? You want the chicken? Oh, do you think the steak, let me look, I'm going to Google review. And there's no fucking time for that. Like life is short and they, they get it more than anybody else. Um, if I have clients who are far, far, far less wealthy and the amount of time they take to think about decisions and this, that, and the other, just like, I, I you know, I don't say it, but inside mm -hmm. I'm like, if you were a billionaire, this would be moving so much faster. <laughs> Interesting. You know, this would be moving so much faster. Like I'm, <laughs> dude, like sitting in here, I've missed like eight phone calls. I've noticed that. That's oh, crazy. Um, gosh. Yeah. It's a lot. But like, you know, right now yeah, this one guy, so this guy is a billionaire. He's texting me. 
It's like, please call me back. Let's make offers on both. Let's try to come in a little bit lower. Let me know what numbers you want to start at. This is like a $40 million apartment. He's trying to go back and forth in between the two. So I got to call him back. Um, and it's just going to do it over text. I'm going to call him back and yeah. he's not going to pick up. Right. And then he's going to text me what he wants me to do. They also text a lot more than anyone else. Do they you send know, voice memos? No, because they don't want their voices recorded. Oh, I'll do okay. like, I'll negotiate something for 1.5 million and I, and the client will need an in-person meeting, right? So they're going to bring their private banker. They want like they want their attorney on the phone. You negotiate with someone who's worth multiple billions of dollars, and it's like a DM because they just don't care and they don't have the time to to waste. And they'll text their ideas and their thoughts. So when it comes time yeah. to actually signing something, then there's absolutely a team of very smart people that are that are risk assessing. Mm -hmm. Like, is this the right thing to do? But it's um an interesting world yeah, a lot of that what i've seen with at least actors is that they are very rarely involved they'll look through it and they'll okay i like it all right you're gonna talk to this person now yeah and for the rest of the deal you don't even communicate with them i know it's so it's annoying someone else yeah. who's making all the decisions on their behalf and you'll call them sometimes and say hey this is what we're doing are you okay oh yeah i know whatever they say they say oh you know i'll listen to them yeah and that's it uh, celebrities do that yeah right i deal with that all the time celebrities models Athletes, it's so annoying because a lot of, the, especially in athletes, they're handlers. Mm -hmm. Like the athletes' handlers aren't, you know, there's business managers, right? There's there's the bankers, etc. But it's like, yeah, you're gonna talk to Richie. I've known Richie since I was two, and Richie is a pain in the is ass. He's a negotiator. Richie? He's a negotiator, but he also he's got his own interests. Uh, like he does his own. He's got his own people. That's why a lot of times you see celebrities running around with with brokers or people you're like who how did you ever even get involved it's because the richie of that you know of that oh. celebrity and friend relationship is getting paid by bobby he's like bob yes. you're, gonna, you're gonna work with my buddy bobby you're like bobby you're giving me 50 percent of whatever leo buys and so like whereas leo could just, you mentioned that where he could just come on, to yeah. it happens all the time yeah. and it's this and then the celebrity doesn't even question it because they have so much trust and faith in their friend because they've been with them forever that they don't even think about the kickbacks that this friend is getting the whole time and how he's living off of you. Whereas like, you know, we'll do, I do deals for free with celebrities. Mm -hmm. They come to me and I'm like, I just want the relationship. Anyone you know, because you know a lot of people, I, I don't need to make money on your sale. I'll sell it, I'll sell it for free. I'll, I'll rent you this place yeah. for free. I won't charge commissions or anything. And yet they end up working with other people where the commission's actually more because Richie says, Leo, that's how it's got to get done here. Sorry, buddy. Sorry, buddy. When he's actually being taken advantage yeah. of his like, poor, poor celebrities. Wow. It's fucked up. But now yeah. at the billionaire level, how yeah. often do they generally negotiate on a deal? Because I would imagine a lot of these cases, they do it's personally. not even worth their time. It's like the more time they spent even negotiating like five mm. million off. Yeah, but they don't want to get a bad, yeah. Or how much of it is purely just they want to get a good deal? It's a good deal. Versus... They don't want to be taken advantage of. They just want a good deal. Um, and they are, you know, they, they take it personally too because it could also be written about. Yes. Like there's no billionaire out there who's like secret, mm -hmm. you know, for the, you know. And so if it's going to be written about, then there's ego, right? There's involvement. Like now all their employees are going to know what they just spent, you know, if they don't bury it. Right, their employees are going to know. Their wives are going to. The ex-wives are going to. The kids are going to know. The kids in their kids' school are going to know. Oh, your dad just bought that big place. My daddy said he overpaid. Your daddy's an idiot. Like that shit happens. Say, are you yeah, seriously? of course, man. Kids are the worst. Like you know, it's going to be written about in the papers. All of a sudden, the company doesn't have a bad year. It's like, ah, oh, well, the CEO overpaid for that property earlier this year. The shareholders must be pissed. Now they're calling for his ouster. Right now, That's they're trying crazy. to take down his pay. Like it all, yeah, it all feeds into together. So, do they have time to negotiate? And does another million or two here or there make any difference? Makes sense. Probably not. But money's money, and most most billionaires that that I work with didn't start that way, right? They 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 worked incredibly hard to get the money or the valuations that they have mm -hmm. in some way, shape, or form, um, and they're going to keep it that way. That's interesting. How easy would it be? to keep that anonymous why don't more people just do anonymous property sales put it under a trust you How try people, people talk out? yeah dude people talk like that deal i did in palm beach it was buried it was buried in llc's there's nothing public about that everywhere it was a cash purchase done incredibly quick no one would know the problem is it's not the only thing we saw right so we saw a bunch of other houses and then reporters 
they're always talking to different brokers no. and different people. And then like, you know, I, I know, I know that's how it got found out. One of the agents on one of the houses that we went to that my guy did not buy was just jealous and spiteful and angry and probably called up a reporter and was like, hey, I know who bought that house. Yeah, yeah, fuck him. This is who it is. Because they know it's going to be upsetting. It's going to make me look bad because I was supposed to bury it. But I always tell everyone, we're going to do everything we possibly can. I've sold properties for billionaires. Yeah. No one will ever know. They don't know about the deal. They don't know about the property. I've never posted about it. I don't talk about it. Like no one, no one, no one knows. But then there are the few that there's just yeah. nothing you can do. How do you prevent that from happening in the future with having another agent or or it could be even like a doorman, let's just say, you, sees someone walk in and they're like, I think that maybe yeah. that's the... So, I mean, I did this. Uh, we sold a place in the Hamptons once. Uh, 2019, I guess, for $40 million to an incredibly well-known, very wealthy person. Um, and to really, really protect that that wouldn't happen, he never came. No one came. I did everything over FaceTime. And he wouldn't even put the camera to him. He had the camera on his desk facing this way. He wouldn't talk or anything. And I just FaceTimed him through and he could see the camera to the side on his phone. And I walked him through and he bought that place for, for 40 just over FaceTime that way. And everything's buried. It's owned in two separate LLCs. Wow. Whoa. How do you verify, though? Because there's, it's a trail somewhere. Like, how do you know? How does that person even approach you? The client approached me? Yeah. How does I mean, that, how I, did that connection was I made? I, I met him a long, long time ago. Way before way before he was but, that wealthy. But then let's – why why the not even showing a face on FaceTime? Because we don't want the listing agent to know who it is. We don't oh, want anyone else. Oh, we don't want the other the listing agent. Yeah, like I'm I'm representing him. So we don't want anyone else, the gardeners, the entity people. See, I was I was with a celebrity earlier wow. today and it's like you walk outside and people just take photos, take photos, and now they see him coming out with me, right? And so people immediately know what it's about. And so there's there's no way around it. So I'll go in different doors, they'll go in different doors, or we'll do things virtually. There's always there's always ways. But sometimes yeah. um uh, it's funny, like we sold, uh, I did the first resale at 220 Central Park South uh, for $33 million to Igor Tulchinsky. Awesome guy. Like hardcore, such a cool guy. Uh, very wealthy guy. Um, and I had the same conversation with him and his people, right? Said, just so you know, if like, because that, that was de depths of COVID. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that was strange. It was $10,000 a foot. Like, if you buy this, Right. And then he also wanted to go to Palm Beach. So he mm -hmm. bought a place for $40 million in Palm Beach. Um, so if you do these deals, I'm going to do everything possible to keep this quiet. And his identity was pretty hidden because he had a huge, huge mask. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a mask like this. Fully masked. Mm -hmm. All the masks. He had all of them. Yeah. Um, back when we had to wear masks all the time. And I was like, someone's going to find out. And he's like, oh, good. Do you think we could put this in the Wall Street Journal? <laughs> yes, we can actually. I know exactly how to do that. And he gave them a quote. He gave them um, uh, a photo, a great photo. <laughs> he had these great articles written about um, how he did it. And, and it was just a different, just a different mentality, a different spin. Wow. And I think also in his business too, I, I think there's probably a correlation between the more successful he is buying What's trophy real estate. What's his business? The more successful his business is. So then people are like, oh, I want to invest money with that guy. I think as I like. Sure. What's his business? Pontificate. Finance. Hedge okay. Funds. Yeah. I could see the correlation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. How much? Yeah, uh, Ken Griffin's yeah. not that quiet. Oh my gosh. His purchases, his art purchases are Dude, everything. insane. He's public. That he, he, bought he, does. The, he bought the Constitution. Yeah. <laughs> and know? what was the price? It was like $50 million. Yeah. Like 43 or 42. Yeah. His son told is, him to buy it. Is he in New York? He has a place in New York. He has all the places in Florida, Palm Beach and Miami wow. and Chicago and everywhere else. So what do you think the difference is in terms of privacy between some people and others? Like it seems like Igor was very much spin it around as a positive. This is a good no, thing. I think it's 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 listen, everyone's different, right? Yeah. Like there are real estate brokers in New York who do amazing, amazing transactions. You don't see them in press ever. They have no social media accounts. No, nothing. And then there's fucking guys like me. Yeah. <laughs> We're like the exact opposite. Sure. You know, it's, um, I don't know. People just, they, I think people built their, they build their businesses differently. I don't know how to have my career without being as out there as I am. It's how I've generated business since day one, yeah. right? Through the power of content, through promotion, the more people who know what I sell, the better. I've never had the opportunity to be quiet about it, you know? 
Whereas a lot of agents who are very, very quiet and are very successful, if they were to all of a sudden try to generate business by being loud, mm. it would hurt the book of the business that they built over such a long period of time based on the fact that they are a complete unknown, but very powerful yeah. in the industry. How many homes do you usually sell from social media? How many leads have brought in from, let's say, TikTok or YouTube? Oh, I mean, uh, we probably get 10 to 15 leads a day, right? How many of those convert into transactions over time? It's not all day, every day, um, but it's probably, I mean, I don't know, it might be 10% of that. Okay. You know? It's still fantastic. One a day. Yeah, and that's from social it. media? Oh, yes. Yeah, 100%. By leads, you just mean like a client that wants to sell their home yeah. that wants buy or sell. Yeah, they want to sell or they want to buy or they're interested in something. They want to, you know, let's be in touch or they're reaching out specifically about a listing because yeah. we do a lot of promotion for the listings, the new developments, everything in general. There was a great, like when we started the company and I, I had this idea of creating a, a content to commerce funnel for all things sales, salespeople and people who need sales people. Um, uh, and it was just weird, right? Uh, we we listed a building in Brooklyn. We did the tour. We did everything. We we optimized it. A girl saw it and came through. Saw the video. Never even thought about buying over there. Bought an apartment for two point three million dollars, and then gave a quote to like the New York Post about why she bought there. And it was like some of the best press we've had as a company. And we we have a lot of press. But I took that because now I can use that with everyone to go through. Like, hey, wow. just so you know, proof is in the pudding. Like, even if it creates one more deal or two more deals to to put property in front of eyeballs that otherwise would not have known about the property who could then potentially purchase it better. Yeah. We've sold $15 million townhouses because a 16-year-old daughter saw the video as we targeted that type of market, showed her parents. Parents said, oh, I wasn't looking at that location, but I'll go take it. And they bought it. That's wild. How is it different than selling a two hundred and fifty million dollar listing? Like, what's are you taking a different approach with like social media? Are you taking maybe the stance that more views the better on something like this and get it out there? Or are you trying to curate the right type of views? Could you explain how that's different? Yeah, I mean, we. I mean, listen, if something's two and a half million dollars, right? We we could put it all over the world, and it's not going to make a difference. Right? We want great exposure, but it's super targeted. Mm -hmm. Like we know that that's probably going to be a local renter or someone who owns a smaller apartment looking to upgrade, someone in probably the immediate tri-state area or like an investor base, right? That's about it. For something that's $250 million, I need to go and find somebody that can afford it that doesn't even know they want it. So it's it's a mixed campaign of target marketing and mass marketing. So mass market through content. And it's not just about views, right? It's the sharing I don't care about the people who see it. I care about how many times it's been engaged with and how many people share it. Because they're sharing it to somebody who could share it to someone else and share it to someone else. And at that point, we don't know how many times mm -hmm. it gets shared. Because people will see it, right? And it'll most oftentimes be a kid. And a kid will see it. who will show it to another kid. who will show it to another kid. who will show it to his mom who works for a guy who works for the buyer, right? And it's this trickle up theory mm -hmm. of kind of how content to commerce ends up working. It's not trickle down, right? It's trickling up the ladder that way. Um, and so it's really, really interesting. And then we, we enact like a real targeted campaign of personal outreach to these people, right? If you can afford it, you need to know about it. And we're getting it in front of you or we're getting it in front of your business managers yeah. or your private bankers or your lawyers. How do you, how do you do that in such a way that it doesn't seem like pitchy? I mean, it is pitchy, okay. but you keep it super simple, yeah. right? You're like, Hey, Mr. Billionaire, my name is Ryan Sarant. We just listed the highest residential home on earth. I know you like trophy property. If you'd like to tour, let me know. Here's some information. Like you're not wasting time. You're not like, oh my God, you need to see. like super, super, super simple. And people respond. You'd be surprised. Really? Yeah, they respond, right? Or they'll send it to someone who will then respond, who will reach out and said, oh, Mr. So-and-so received an email from Ryan about a, a property. We, we'd like to ask, is that on the X? And you know, they have questions. And so it's, so it works. So it's target plus mass. You bring it together and that's how you sell. I feel like billionaires or people of that status would be so privy to like people pitching them and trying to add extra details and stuff like that. So they'd be very, they, they would appreciate a nice, concise, you know, like not very. You got to be simple. 
Exactly. Like I, I always remember that phrase, right? Kiss, keep it simple, stupid all the time. Mm-hmm. Don't waste anyone's time. Don't be overly pitchy. Don't introduce yourself for two pair. No one gives a shit, right? And they all have funnels and filters to get rid of all the stuff. So like all the apps that these guys are being pitched all the time and all the NFTs and all the crypto and all the stuff and all the new business ideas, mm-hmm. it's funneled and someone will, will look through it, you know, sometimes or just goes to junk. Um, but we have ways of getting in front of people you know, where they actually will have to see it and make a decision. There's a lot of different ways that we've perfected over the years. Can you share any of those or is that a trade secret? I don't know if it's a trade secret, but if I say it here, then other brokers will use my shit, you know? Okay. So probably keep that stuff to us. Okay. How often is it if you get reached out to by a billionaire, is it like the billionaire themselves? Or is it usually just like the, Mm. you know, their assistant or something like that? Sometimes like if it's email, or phone, it's them directly. Because hmm. you can get people's phone numbers and you call them and they pick up the phone, right? And you have two seconds to make an impression. Um, email, they'll, they'll respond. But if they're like, want to sell something or they want to buy something, it's hardly ever them. It's it's one of their handlers, one of their people who will reach out. And oftentimes you won't know who it is until you start to figure it out. How is the New York market changing right now with higher interest rates? It definitely took a, a beating last year. I think like most markets did, mm-hmm. right? The minute the monthly cost doubled really, really quickly. Everyone kind of said, wait, can I afford this? Um, uh, the biggest difference is with with doubled rates as fast as they've, they've gone, I think you've talked about this too, you have sellers who are just locked in. Mm-hmm. So the inventory stays low. So you've kind of got this you know, real estate stagflation, which is sellers can't afford to sell because they can't buy where they want to go. They can't go right. get a bigger place. They can never afford it. And they have a low rate, so why sell? So the general construction business Mm. has gone through the roof home renovations like you cannot get people because people can't move they can't afford to go buy something there's then nothing on the market because sellers aren't selling buyers don't know what to do because inventory is so low and then sellers end up just renovating so like even my little brother outside boss he's like dude i it's like i can't afford the house i want to anymore you know what the monthly payment would be so we're doing an addition but the addition now yeah. costs double what it did even a year ago because everyone is doing additions. Hmm. It's weird. It's just huge disparity between current payments and what people got locked in yeah. two years ago. And you had like the same unit, same building, same everything. One person is paying 10000 a month. The other person is paying 5000 a yep. month for the same unit, similar price. Yep. It's too bad that loans are unassumable. Like if someone was able to sell that 3% loan, it would be worth a lot of money. Correct. There are markets where you can do that, and you can do it in commercial. I've noticed that, yes. Yes. You can do it in commercial, um, which is why the commercial market hasn't changed, right? And it makes properties even more val- valuable because you can then, you're purchasing someone's rate. Yeah. Residential, uh, at least in New York, the only thing you can assume is you can assume the amount of the loan and therefore bypass what is in New York City called the mortgage recording tax mm. of 2% of the loan amount, but you are going to have to get today's rate. We were talking with someone on the podcast the other week who was saying that um, the due on sale clause is ra- rarely ever enforced if you continue just making the payments. Have you ever experienced that before? Like the bank just calling? Yeah. In terms of, let's say you sell the property, but you keep the mortgage. And you just make the payments on the mortgage. No, I've never, I've never seen that before. <laughs> Neither have I. Never. But, uh, we we had someone else on the podcast who says he does this all the time. Really? And has not had an issue with the Why? banks. I think twice out twice. of like yeah, but he, he resolved deals, the issues like very deals. fast. Yeah, it was not an issue. Yeah, interesting. No. Yeah. And in our markets and our price points, I've never seen that. Maybe in lower price points. It could be the lower price points where mm-hmm. it's different, yeah, like five hundred grand yeah, it could and be. under. It could be. Yeah. Um, I want to be respectful for your time. I know it's almost... Uh, three, yeah, I got to go sell something now. Yeah, 3.30. Good timing. Uh, is there anything else you want to mention? Anything you want to throw up here? Pitch? Well, anything? you just came and did our new podcast, yes. The Business of Influence. So make sure to go check it out, right? Go check yep. it out. Your episode, by the time you put this up, is probably going to be up, and it's it's awesome. I'll link to it. That means right after this, you could click that, and then you could watch that. There you go. Be perfect. Like there a two-hour-long podcast. So awesome. Like, keep watching... In the link in the description. More Graham. That's what we <laughs> just should just watch be. me for another hour. More Graham. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I would love for everyone to go check that out. I mean, cool. I'm everywhere, but they should go check that out. We'd love the love. Cool. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks guys. Really appreciate Thanks for coming it. to New York. Until next time. Mm-hmm.